Hi, we're back with these arc dot LED lights, which we were reverse engineering in the previous video. And uh, where we got to is we had worked out the protocol that these lights used so that we could then start writing some firmware to control these without needing to use that main controller box. Because what I'd like to do is be able to eliminate that controller and run these lights from something like WLED so that we can have all of the nice patterns and that kind of stuff working without needing to have some software running on a PC. So I got to the point where I was having a look at the data that we'd acquired previously and I was trying to work out how we can actually implement this in firmware because uh, how I'd interpreted it last time is that we had 8 bits of data and then on this first byte of data coming out uh, that was acting as sort of a start of frame or address and then we had all of the other data bytes following after that and it looked like the stop bit was inverted compared to all of the data bytes following that. And I was trying to work out how we could do this because you're not normally able to control the polarity of the stop bit in UART hardware. And then it was only when I started playing around just with getting some of the hardware working, I realized that the stop bit is actually here and we actually have nine bits of data. So if we change this to nine bits here then suddenly we don't have this framing error all of the stop bits are exactly where they need to be and in fact we're just clearing the ninth bit for that address byte and then it's set for all the data bytes now unusually that's the opposite to what you'd normally do if you were sending out an address byte normally you'd have that ninth bit set and then all of the data bytes would have that one cleared but they've done it the opposite way around in this one uh, and so I thought, great, we'll get started with that. And maybe we can even just use the ESP32 directly. Load WLED onto here, but with a custom plugin. And send out that custom data packet from the ESP32. And then, to my surprise, when I started looking into the details of the UART on here, the ESP32 doesn't support 9 bits of data. Uh, which I didn't even realise was a thing. I think this is the first microcontroller I've come across that only supports 8 bits of data uh, with the UART peripheral. So unfortunately what that means is, barring implementing that protocol uh, with the SPI peripheral on here, which you could do, but uh, I was thinking what's the easiest path and also what would be useful in the future I think is to have some kind of bridge that could bridge DMX to the protocol that these lights use. So I think what I'm going to have is another microcontroller that does the bridge from DMX to this protocol and then have the ESP32 outputting DMX from WLED. And then that also means that other PCB that I make we can use just with normal DMX hardware as well. And also with the WLED um, installation. If I do end up with some DMX fixtures, I can just add those in using the same protocol. So in order to get started with this, a while back I made a video with these RGB touch controllers where we reverse engineered these modules and I actually ended up making a new PCB to fit inside the enclosure and what this did is allow me to control some DMX lights from this controller and I also put my own custom firmware so we could have light patterns and stuff um, but these were just plain open collector outputs on here this PCB let me output DMX protocol so that I could control the DMX lights in the lab and also in other places in the house now um, but what we've got here is a PIC micro that has two UART interfaces and I know these support the 9-bit protocol and so what we'll be able to do is accept DMX on one of the RS485 interfaces and then output the ARC.2 protocol on the other one and then what we'll do after we've made sure that we've got it working is design a new PCB to act as the bridge between the ESP32 and these lights and then we'll get some more PCBs made and we'll get these ones made at our sponsor for this video PCB Way. So this video is sponsored by PCB Way, your one-stop shop for all things project related you can get your PCBs manufactured here with a wide variety of customizable options. You can get those PCBs assembled with components on both sides of the PCB. And they also do manufacturing capabilities related to mechanical stuff, so CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication and injection moulding. And I'd also like to draw your attention to the project design contest which PCB Way are holding. 
So if you have a project that meets the criteria here, either an electronics project, a mechanical project, or a project involving STM32s, then you can submit your project. It will be reviewed between January and February next year, and in March the results will be announced, and there are some pretty decent prizes to be won, including $1,500 cash and a $200 coupon to spend at PCBWay, and then there's various other prizes as well that make it well worth entering. So don't forget to visit PCBWay.com. WLED does actually support DMX output. It's not quite as well implemented as I would like, and you do have to build the source from scratch, which means downloading the source code from GitHub and then loading it into something like Visual Studio Code. Once you've got it in there, there are some instructions on the WLED website. You need to pick your specific target. In this case, I'm going to be using an ESP32, so you need to make sure that, that line is uncommented. And then in WLED.h, you also need to uncomment the line that says hash define WLED enable DMX. And once you've done that, you can then build the project. So we'll click build here. After loading the firmware, you'll be able to connect to the access point that the ESP32 creates to configure the Wi-Fi. And then once you're connected to Wi-Fi, you can visit the local address and you'll get the familiar WLED user interface. And if we go to config, we should have this new menu item that says DMX output. And if we click on here, this is our configuration for the DMX. Now, I don't think this is quite as good as it could be or as intuitive. Basically, for this to work, you have to have identical DMX um, items on the bus. So it'll only work with, for example, RGB LEDs. You can't mix it between RGB LEDs and some moving heads or anything like that. Uh, so the configuration here is we've got three DMX channels per fixture. And then it's also saying the spacing between each LED fixture is also three addresses. We click on DMX map and it will show us that we've got an assigned um, fixture here. DMX address one, two and three is red, green and blue. Now this is where I think it gets a little bit confusing. What we actually have to do is go into LED preferences and you'll see here that we've got LED outputs uh, configured here, just a WS2812 LED and just one of those that's already on the development board. What we actually want to do is if you want to address 128 RGB LED fixtures, you put this in here, and even though we haven't got WS2812 LEDs connected, when we go back to DMX output now and look at the map, we've got 128 DMX fixtures assigned. So that's kind of what you have to do. It's not completely intuitive. And then at that point, um, we can actually have a look at the DMX output from the board. So I've just attached the oscilloscope probe to channel 2 which is the fixed output for DMX on WLED and then if we have a look at the picoscope output you can see we've got our DMX data coming out. So this modification to WLED actually uses this SparkFun DMX um, plugin and what I was hoping I'd be able to do is modify this code directly to output the codes to the light fixtures. But unfortunately, as I said, it's got the serial configuration here, eight bits of data and two stop bits, but unfortunately you can't change this to nine bits of data. Otherwise, we could stop here, just make a small modification to the code here, and the ESP32 would be able to drive the LED fixtures directly. So instead, I think what we're going to end up doing is modifying the existing code that I've got for this DSPIC 33 EV series of microcontrollers. And we can do that in MP Lab. This particular microcontroller doesn't have um, anything specific that we need for this project other than the fact it's got two UARTs. It doesn't have a UART that natively supports DMX, which some of the products do. However, the parametric search seems to have lost the UART column as far as I can see on the microchip website. So I can't actually see which ones have multiple UARTs, have uh, DMX support, which just aids with handling the break and mark after break. But we can definitely do that with this microcontroller uh, just by adding some custom code before we do the UART decoding. So as I said, this PCB already had some software on it from my previous project, which supported DMX. Instead, what we're going to be doing is changing it from the transmit mode to receive, and it's going to be storing the data that is received into a buffer. And in this code, it's fairly straightforward. It handles all of the various states for the DMX. As I said, if we had a microcontroller that already supported 
DMX directly, then we wouldn't need this stuff to work out where the break occurs and the mark after break. Uh, but it's really not too much hassle to handle this. So we've got some code to set up the UART for reception, 8 bits, with two stop bits. And then if we look in the code, in the UART receive interrupt, all it's doing is looking for the framing error, and that is the break condition. And then from that point onwards, we just need to keep on receiving bytes and fill that buffer. And then if you remember from the previous video, we've got this stream of data which we send out to change the color to the RGB LED. So a start of frame, a command byte, and then all of the data bytes. And in the code here, we've got a structure which has that start code, the command code, and then the 512 bytes of data. And then in the initialization code, we've got some magic numbers here for setting up the UART. This is not the right way to write firmware, but it gets you up and running nice and quickly. And this just sets up the UART for nine bits of data, one stop bit at one megabits per second. When we're in the normal mode where we're just sending color data out to the LEDs, every 20 milliseconds or so, we end up in this timer interrupt. And here we stand out the start code, which then starts off all of the UART transmission. And then we just continue sending out all of the data, all 512 bytes of data to the LEDs. And after that's completed, the transmission is complete. And then we have to wait for the next timer interrupt to fire before we send out another frame of data. So with this 20 millisecond timer interrupt, we end up with 50 hertz refresh rates. I've also written some code for the auto addressing. And I've tried to recreate these original waveforms as closely as possible. So we're sending out this data 0071151000 at 25 millisecond intervals. And we do that 160 times. And then we repeat that with this slightly different frame. And as you can see, I've got the software here. The auto address starts that process off. And then in the timer interrupt, depending on how many sets of data we've sent out, we either do the first set of data, the 0071151100, or that second set of data. 8158100100 and then after it's finished sending that out we go back into the normal mode of just sending color data out to the lights and so with the PIC programmed up on here we can go and test this out in the garden I've just wired this up with these boards like this for now just to test everything out and at the moment the first thing that this does when it's first powered up is do the automatic addressing and then it goes into the automatic uh, mode for sending data out I think on the board that we designed with the pick on here, what we'll end up doing is having a button to do the automatic addressing rather than just doing it every time it's powered up. Uh, and then just one thing to point out is I really do like these development boards for the ESP32. You can swap out the modules on the top, uh, but it's the ESP32 module and then a breakout board. And I think this breakout board is designed really well. There's a bunch of buffers underneath the socket for the ESP32 and that drives these LEDs around the outside and these LEDs basically just echo whatever is happening at each of the pins on the board here so you can basically see at a glance what's happening with all the inputs and outputs. Then you've got these pins at the side ground 5 volt and signal so as you can see the grounded 5 volts I'm feeding into the ICSP header for the pick so that's powering up this board and then the yellow wire is our DMX signal. We don't need to use the differential output just for this short distance, but the yellow set of pins represents what's on these terminals at the side. And then they've put a DC to DC converter and a 3.3 volt regulator on the board as well. So you plug in a seven to 12 volt DC adapter, and then I think you get up to three amps on the five volt output and also the 3.3 volt supply as well. So the jack here will power everything and there's plenty of current available. So these development boards are really great. I'll put a link to the Amazon uh, listing for these because I highly recommend these. I bought a whole bunch of these uh, because they work so well. So this is where we've been focusing some of our efforts this year in the garden. Uh, I've laid this porcelain patio and next year there will be a pergola that we're building above that and that will have a bunch of solar panels on top as well. Uh, and then also we've redone the play area. So we've got some artificial grass on here and I think about 20 tons of bulk bags has gone into making this area this summer. And the last hour or so, you can see I've just buried these lights all the way along the border. Now I've got these lights 
all over the garden that come on at night so this one's gonna have to be decommissioned I'll put that in a box with some waterproofing gel and then you can see the lights are all scattered in here as well I might end up putting some in the tower as well to make that look cool and then the lights are just along in the border all over there as well now I have got power over to this area of the garden uh, there's an electrical box here with a Hager fuse box and there is room at the bottom potentially for some of the lighting control or maybe I'll end up just sticking it inside the playhouse right so here we are in the playhouse sorry it's dark in here the OG viewers might remember the IKEA kitchen which I modified all those years ago and we've got the little setup here with one of the power supplies and then we've got the two development boards so let's power on the development board and see if the auto addressing works and that looked like a success now I think when they auto addressed previously they all illuminated white but I think there must be some voltage drop along that length of cable because there's quite a lot on here and so they started to look a little bit red so I think some serious voltage drop but that is all working as you know when you first power up WLED you get the orange LEDs and they're illuminating nicely and then in WLED we can change the brightness so we can put it up to maximum brightness here and then we can test out some of the colour modes. So we've got colour twinkles here. This one's called Dissolve. Dynamic. Now some of these are a little bit garish, I think, for the garden. But there's some nice looking ones. This mode is called Pacifica and I think this one looks quite nice, especially at night time. But I think there's a little bit of tweaking to do to find some that are suitable for sort of a more relaxed scene than some of the quite garish colour changes that they've got, uh, some of the default ones on here. But anyway, this all seems to be working quite nicely. I think there is definitely an issue with voltage drop if you were to have more than about 80 here. As I said, I think there's 72 or 74 out here at the moment. And that's probably about as much as you'd want on one string without injecting power sort of halfway along um, so that we don't have too much voltage drop towards the end. So in the next video, what we're going to do is design the schematic and the PCBs for this. And now that we've all got it working, I think that means we shouldn't have any issues with implementing that schematic. So I hope you'll join me for that video in the future. If you've got any thoughts or comments, don't forget to leave them in the comments section down below. And until next time, thanks for watching.